So let's talk about live jazz in the 1970s. There's a thread that was started by uh, Sherv, AKA Julius Jabbar. Um, Julius Jabbar, Sherv has turned me on to a lot of great music and he shows a lot of really interesting jazz, avant-garde, uh, international, African, just <laughs> so much great stuff that I get addicted to. And he started a thread, uh, it's been followed up by several people, included a new uh, person in Europe, Infinite Sound, and they've shown some amazing records, live records from the 70s, a dozen live records, so sort of a baker's dozen of, of live music. Um, I have to <laughs> change mine out a little bit, because I realized when I was thinking about this, I don't have a lot of live albums specifically recorded by jazz artists in the 70s, so I'm going to take it uh, from a little different angle. Again, I was fortunate enough to, uh, to grow up in the San Francisco Bay Area. And in the 1970s, I really started getting into jazz and saw a lot of the great, what I consider legacy acts. At a time, some of, their, some of them were during their peak. Some of them, you might say, w was the, past their peak uh, when rock and roll took over uh, and uh, the jazz clubs were d dwindling. In San Francisco in 1972, Todd Barkin opened a club called the Keystone Corner, and that's K, Keystone, Corner, K. And he named it, he was influenced by the name uh, because of the Keys, Keystone Cops. It had been like this hippie bar with some jamming and some some of the rock and roll people like from Big Brother and the San Francisco groups would, would pop in there and jam, and I never went there during that time. But it was right on Vallejo Street uh, on the edge in North Beach and a part of North Beach that's right between North Beach and Chinatown. So it's a whole mix of Chinese uh, restaurants and culture stores and the Italian stores from North Beach. And right across the alley from the Keystone Corner was the Central Police Station, one of the, uh, the main police station in that area of San Francisco. So Todd Barkin kind of named the Keystone Corner because of the Keystone Cops. Was, it opened in 72, it lasted till, I don't know, 82, 83, give or take. And, you know, just financial woes happened, uh, the jazz scene. But again, I saw some great artists, some accidentally, some because of my roommate Brooks, who uh, has been on this channel. We've shared uh, a lot of jazz shit together, and uh, we worked in record stores together. And then um, uh, later in the late 70s, my girlfriend, uh, Nancy, who worked at a radio station called KSAN managed a jazz band, which will end up uh, this. So I thought I'd show a dozen artists that I saw live during this great time. I saw them live in the 70s. The albums I sh I'm showing are not necessarily live albums and really not of the period. I just want to show these records just as a, just as a, a visual to give you some uh, point of reference who these artists are. Now, I think it was in 76. My dates might be wrong on some of these, but there was sort of this reunion show. And a lot of times at the Keystone, a, an artist would take, do sort of a residency of a week. Sometimes it was just a weekend that they're passing through. But a lot of times by the time they were there, they might as well do a week. So you'd have five, six, seven days of shows by one artist. And um, as an addendum to this, there's a, uh, there was a place called, the, it's still existent, but called the Bach Dancing Dynamite Society. And it was basically a guy's beach house. Peter Douglas had this beach house down about 40 minutes from San Francisco before Half Moon Bay in an area called, um, uh, what was it called? Miramar, Miramar Beach. Over Devil Slide, down on the way to Half Moon Bay. And Miramar, he had this basically since the late 50s, early 60s, a house where they just had jam sessions and literally even through the 70s you could show up drop a donation in the kitty open the refrigerator grab a beer and see some amazing artists so what would happen usually is artists that were playing in san francisco or oakland on you know throughout the week or the saturday night would the next afternoon sunday afternoon play a gig at the um at the dynamite uh, house his house and you could just hang out in the loft area and watch. I saw some great, great artists there uh, over the years. Um, now it's a little more refined as a little theater setup. It's been expanded and renovated. Anyway, we all know this album, the great album. It's being reissued uh, on a really great analog pressing coming out imminently. Getson Gilberto, early 60s record, obviously not a 70s record. 
but I saw uh, Stan Getz and Gio Gilberto. They did a 1976 sort of reunion tour of Getz and Gilberto, Girl from Ipanema, um, not with Antonio Carlos Jobim, but still a great set. I saw them at the Keystone Corner. Amazing, amazing set. So it was really great to see these artists uh, live in, the, you know, tiny, tiny venue. I think less than 100 people, maybe 150 people. Maybe not even that big. Tiny, tiny place. Anyway, in the 1970s, gets, Stan Getz. Um, what's playing in the background now is from a Verve collection. However, I did was able, to, lucky to see uh, the great Bill Evans in the 70s. This is the closest record I have to around this period uh, when he had gained weight, more husky, not the skinny, cool tie. Uh, with the comb back hair that he did, like for instance, on uh, Kind of Blue and uh, the great uh, you know, jazz of the 60s and his stuff is pretty amazing. This on Fantasy Record, produced by Orrin Keep News, I believe, was it? Um, oh, produced by Helen Keane, I'm sorry. Helen Keane was his longtime manager and producer later on. Uh, this is a record called Alone again, and it's another uh, solo album. He's did a lot of great solo pieces. I saw him at the Keystone twice around the mid 70s, I'm thinking 75, 76-ish. And I went down and I saw him uh, at the um, Bach Dancing and Dynamite Society in a very intimate setting. So I made sure the next morning or the next, you know, the end of that run at the Keystone, I'd go down and see him. I found out he was playing down there. So I saw him down there uh, in Miramar Beach around that time. So I'm so thrilled to have seen um, the great Bill Evans. Probably my favorite jazz piano player. Another artist I saw twice at the Keystone is Dexter Gordon. Obviously, this is from the early 60s, uh, 1965. This is uh, Dexter Gordon, Bobby Hutcherson, Barry Harris, Bob Crenshaw, Billy Higgins, Blue Note, um, getting around. Obviously, this is not a live record. It's not a 70s record, but I'm showing this as an illustration of the great, great uh, Dexter Gordon. Another artist I realized I don't have anything on vinyl for is Bobby Hutcherson. Uh, he lived around the Bay Area during the 70s, and I saw him probably five or six times, the great vibe player. And I'm embarrassed to say I don't have any of his records. I need to, uh, I need to resolve that situation. So Bobby Hutchinson, Hutchison was someone who played a lot at the Keystone. But again, I saw Dexter Gordon twice, and what was amazing about him, he has a I mean, tall man, I'm thinking he's six foot five, but I'm not sure, but very tall, very just large in stature and a great, great player. But at the end of each set or at each section, you know, he'd almost do like this ohm thank you to the audience. He'd take a saxophone and hold it out <laughs> like this. This is not a saxophone. This is a guitar. Epiphone. Casino. That John Lennon and many of the Beatles played. Anyway, um... He would hold it out to the audience like as if an offering to the audience a thank you. He'd kind of bow and hold his saxophone out with two hands. So uh, the great Dexter Gordon, I was fortunate enough to see in the 70s at the Keystone Corner. Another artist I saw several times is Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers. Now this period of time uh, with the Jazz Messengers, I believe it was uh, Cedar Walton and Woody Shaw was in his band. Although... He had different configurations. I saw him before, I had never saw him into the early 80s when uh, the Marsalis brothers uh, joined up. But as you know, in a way, Art Blakey is very similar to um, John Mayall. All, you know, great talent scout, had great artists. And obviously, you know, the artists in the late 50s and 60s were the ones that we all know. These, these great musicians went through the Art Blakey. Now, this guy, you all know is a powerhouse. I love Art Blake, I love the Jazz Messengers. This is a 70s uh, issue. So this is something around the time period. I think this was, this is 1972. So this is probably three or four years before I saw Art Blakey. Uh, this is called um, Child's Dance. It's with Woody Shaw, George Cable, and Stan Clark, Stanley Clark, uh, who would get m m working a lot with Chick Corea and the whole fusion thing in the 70s. Uh, I missed seeing him with um, Stanley Clark, but I believe that they played early on at the Keystone, possibly. 
uh, in that form of uh, jazz messengers, but I never saw that. But um, great artist. Another drummer I don't have here on vinyl, but I'll mention is I saw it twice also. There's El the great Elvin Jones. Talk about powerhouse drummers there. Uh, so great. I didn't see Tony Williams until the 80s, and I've talked about Tony Williams on my channel. Saw him in New York, but um, we're sticking with the 70s here. So the great Art Blakey, Jazz Messengers, you all seem around the vinyl community here and, and shown frequently and loved by so many. Again, one of the great uh, piano players, um, McCoy Tyner. This is a 70s record recorded live in 1978 in Japan by Oren Keat News. Um, this, this is called Counterpoints. This is with Ron Carter and Tony Williams. What a great, now I would have loved to have seen this trio. I never saw this trio, but I saw him play twice again. Went to a lot of repeat shows um, during the week at the Keystone Corner. This was a, uh, he's a great piano player. We used to refer to him, or I used to refer, think of him as the Led Zeppelin of piano players, because at this time, he really had this. Like, he was loud. He was forceful on the keys. But um, the great McCoy Tyner, obviously a part of the great Coltrane Quartet. This is on Concord. Possibly past his prime, but one of my favorite uh, white saxophone players is Art Pepper. Saw him, I think really late, I'm thinking 79 to 80. Uh, Keystone Corner closed down in 82 or 83, as I said, but um, what a great record uh, this is. This is Art Pepper, the rhythm section with Red Garland, Paul Chambers, and Philly Joe Jones. This is a, um, this is remastered in 1988, but I believe this is 1957. This is recorded. Great record. He had a really fast uh, sound, really, you know, the West Coast jazz scene, but it was great seeing Art Pepper, someone I really admired and really loved. Um, and it was, again, for me, this was magic stuff. Seeing the, I was in my 20s when I saw all this music, and just to see the, uh, a lot of these artists, uh, I think he died in 80, early 80s, 82, 83, Art Pepper. Now, one artist I saw once, and it was probably the wildest friggin' thing I ever saw um, at the Keystone. And I don't know if I got it, but looking back on it, I'm so glad I saw it. And that's Ross on the Lone Kirk. Um, blind musician, blind jazz player, horn player, reed player. Sometimes he'd play two to three instruments. He'd have them in his mouth at once. Uh, this is Natural Black Intentions Root Strata. This is from 1971, so it's the only uh, 70s record I have handy of Ross and Roland Kirk. I don't have a live record of his. But um, you must read the back of this album. I mean, it gets... It's just an amazing record. Um, produced by Joel Dorn, who's an Atlantic staff producer. But... Um, oh, God. Um... What can I say? Uh, Ross and Roland Kirk, out there, really out there music, really uh, amazing stuff though. I mean, avant-garde. You know, if you're in a, if you're in a, if you're a Captain Beefheart fan of uh, pop rock and roll music, you could get, probably get into a Ross and Roland Kirk stuff. Amazing, amazing artist. Did see Jimmy Smith once in the late '70s as well. Uh, this is a, a '60s record, I believe. This is uh, the unpredictable Jimmy Smith arranged by the great Oliver Nelson, arranger, conductor, composer. This has nothing to do with live in the 70s, but again, great B3 organ player, uh, probably uh, you know the biggest selling artist when he was on Blue Note, of well, the Blue Note artists. And this is when he was on uh, Impulse Records, right? Yeah, oh, Verve, this is Verve, I'm sorry. This is a Verve collection produced by Creed Taylor. Includes a jazz version of Walk on the Wild Side. An artist I knew nothing about at the time, and I was dragged to the show. I forgot who, if it was Brooks or someone else, but it was Sonny Stitt. Again, another great uh, sax player on Impulse here. 
I went to some of these shows too, even though they weren't on the label by this time. Uh, in 78, 79, 80, I worked uh, for ABC Records and, and then MCA for a brief time. And one of the labels that they distributed, obviously, was uh, Impulse Records. And I could kick myself because during that time, I was able to get Impulse promos free or cheap. And I bought a lot up. And most of these were the green label period of the 70s uh, Impulse. Still all analog, still sound great, really well pressed. I know everyone likes the uh, great original orange labels. Occasionally, I would get orange label promos or copies when I'd order them for my collection because um, they'd be in stock, old stock. So sometimes it just whatever you'd get. Um, and unfortunately, like most people of a certain generation in the um, mid 90s, when I purged a lot of my records, I purged a lot of jazz records thinking, oh, CDs is the way to go. So almost all those great impulse records, you know, I probably had 60 to 75 impulse records from the 70s in pristine shape and they went away. Anyway, Sonny Stitt. Now I'm gonna change venues here just because there's so many great jazz venues, or not great jazz venues. There weren't a lot, except for the Keystone uh, Corner in San Francisco. There are other areas that play jazz. And I went to this concert. This was a reunion of VSOP, a very special one-time performance. And this was at the Greek Theater, 1977. Uh, on the UC Berkeley campus, and it was basically the great quintet. Ron Carter, Herbie Hancock, Freddie Hubbard, pretty much sitting in for miles, Wayne Shorter, and Tony Williams. I mean, what a show, what a concert. That's an outdoor sort of amphitheater type venue. Sports enough to go to one of the shows. I think they have several shows, as I believe, to say here. Yeah, July 6th, July 17th and 18th at, oh, okay, one night it was recorded here at the uh, Greek Theater, the other at the San Diego Civic Theater. Uh, so it's a combination of those dates. I think they did a tour of this. Um, just a great, great, uh, great musicians, and it, I feel fortunate enough to have seen this. Luckily, everyone here is alive. Freddie Hubbard? I don't think he is. Can't remember now, but oh, Tony Williams, of course, he died um, way too young. Uh, Wayne Shorter, Herbie Hancock, and Ron Carter. By the way, I'm recording this on the 25th of August, 2020. It happens to be Wayne Shorter's birthday today. So, the quintet, the quintet. I said this many times on my um, on different. Uh, videos I've uh, done here on jazz and crossovers. I did see Miles Davis once. I saw him in, I think it was 1973. It was at Frost Amphitheater on Stanford University's, University's campus down uh, just an hour south of San Francisco. And there's no record specifically for that. So this is the closest. Um, this is um, Agartha, Agatha, Agartha out there, wild record. Um, anyway, I saw them perform. They did sort of, it seemed seemingly like one long piece. And I forgot all the musicians because I didn't know who the musicians were. I have photographs of that. And if I can, I'll tack a couple at the end of this video that I took. But the funny thing about this concert is the <laughs> Miles Davis opened up for the new riders of the Purple Sage. Really? Uh, out there stuff, fusiony, just scattered, but really, really beautiful. On this record, this is recorded in the in um, early. This is like probably seventy five, nineteen seventy six. So this would have been after. Uh, this is recorded in Tokyo, um, and this is with Sonny Fortune, Michael Henderson, Pete Cosley, Al Foster, Reggie Lucas, and Batuma on Congo. Now, this could have been some of the same musicians, and uh, those of you who are Miles aficionados would know who he toured with at what time. I didn't look it up, but 1973, this was the closest. This is a live album from the 70s, and it's a really cool, cool record. So I'm going with Miles Davis, okay? Now, lastly, uh, these are probably musicians, a musician you've never heard of, but my girlfriend, 
actually at the time in 78, 79, manage this band, San Francisco band. And it's Listen feeling, featuring Mel Martin. These are on Inner City Records, Inner City. I know I see a lot of uh, people into really avant-garde and interesting jazz are picking up uh, old Inner City Records. It was a label owned by Irv Kratka out of New York. The little trivia thing about that, Irv Kratka made his money in the late 50s and early 60s, mostly in the 60s, doing a series of records called MMO, Music Minus One. Those of you of a certain age might remember that. You'd buy, like, for instance, if you were a sax player, you'd buy a Music Matters One uh, record, and it had everything on the record except the sax part. You'd get the score inside so you could play along. Obviously, it's like karaoke for your instrument way before all this digital stuff, so you'd play along with that record. If you were a piano player, it would have everything except the piano parts. Music Minus One was a huge business. I think it was sold years later to Hal Leonard, uh, the sheet music company and um, that. But but in the 70s, I believe, um, Irv Kratka started this jazz label, did some reissues, did some original artists. Mel Martin, this is her first album on Inner City. Uh, it's, it's Mel Martin, Dave Dunaway, Andy Norell, and George Marsh. George Marsh, great kind of interesting, really drummer, almost like, uh, I can't describe his drumming playing. He played a really small drum kit, which is really interesting. Well, jazz kits tend to be smaller until you get the super drummers later on. But um, Andy Norell was a great vibe player. He left after this album, although he did contribute here and there to them. And they, um, But they were really good. Mel Martin, uh, some of you may know, he was in the Boz Gags band, and Boz Gags blues band. If you know the Boz Gags song, We Were Only Sweetheart, that great flute solo in that is Mel Martin. He was around the San Francisco scene, big session musician in San Francisco. Uh, I knew Mel for many years, used to see them play. In fact, I went on a tour up, up Pacific Northwest with them, with Nancy in 1979, I believe, 78 or 79. Um, but this, it's actually kind of a nice record. I mean, it's it's nothing hard, but it's really, really ethereal a little ways, but, but, but straight ahead. So it's nothing avant-garde, but great album. This record is the second one they did, and it's called Growing. It's really pretty. They got, um, they added, um, let's see, Larry Dunlap to piano. And um, what's interesting about this, because there is a Beatle connection. The Beatle connection is, this front cover photograph is by a photographer named Kendall Johnson. And if you see it, it's sort of this, uh, almost like infrared type photography. Same photographer that did the cover of George Harrison's In the Material World, Living in the Material World of the Hand. So that's the Beatle connection here. Anyway, Inner City Records, Listen, featuring Mel Martin um, on Inner City. I saw them so many times live in the 70s. Uh, they played the Keystone Corner as well, and they played around, went on tour. Um, but uh, Mel Martin died about two years ago. May he rest in peace. What a great man. Continue to work live doing gigs, doing saxophone, uh, had a, 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 a quartet, I think, uh, playing around the Bay Area mostly, but around, did a lot of session work still. So uh, this is for Mel, and um, thank you, Vinyl Community, and um, again, great, great time to see jazz in the 1970s, even the people who are on the, um, on, you know, their last legs in some ways, but I feel honored about that. So thanks, Sherv for uh, starting this whole thread, and um, Mazzy loves you.